We're going to begin. An apology that we are a minute late. We'll try and make up that time. A very good morning and welcome to the session titled Realizing Africa's Century. My name is Nzinga Kunta. I'm a business news anchor on the public broadcast in South Africa, the SABC. And it's my great pleasure to be your facilitator today as we take a look at Africa and what it needs to do to realize its potential. Africa is the youngest and fastest growing continent in the world. It's also home to over 60% of uncultivated arable land and has an abundance of minerals necessary for the energy transition. So how then do the public and private sector leaders take advantage of this? How do we move fully into Africa's century? Joining me on the panel today are the President of the Swiss Confederation, Alan Besse, the Head of Government of Tunisia, Professor Najla Boudin, the Under Secretary General of the United Nations, Winnie Benima, will join us a bit later on, and the Chairman of Multi Choice, Imtiaz Patel. Thank you all of you for being here. Just a reminder that the hashtag for this event is hashtag WEF23. For those joining us online on television, that's what you can use to be part of the discussion. For those of us joining us in the room, we will be taking questions a little bit later on in the second part of this discussion. Let's begin then, Professor Bowden, if I can start with you. What are the priorities that you think are needed in order to unleash Africa's potential? Thank you. Uh if you permit, uh, I will talk in French. I'm more comfortable in French, but uh, maybe I will shift uh, from time to time. I think that. Uh, oh, donc. Uh, I think time has come for Africa to take charge uh, in a context that you know, a context of crisis, imported crisis regarding uh, the pandemic the uh, crisis stemming from the Ukrainian war and other crises that are uh, characterizing our continent, including uh, poverty, for example, but also terrorism and obviously climate change. Our top priorities for Africa to take charge is to invest, first of all, invest in people. The biggest potential of Africa is its youth and its women. The aspiration six of the agenda of 2063 uh, is that uh, the African Union asked for the full potential of Africa to be unleashed through its youth and women. And this includes, of course, capacity building. It includes encouraging uh, the youngsters, women to become entrepreneurs, and we need to learn how to boost startup companies. This is our number one priority. Then we need to reinforce our climate resilience, uh, the climate resilience of the planet altogether. The energy mix, in spite of the huge potential of our planet uh, in terms of solar energy, uh, wind power, and geothermal, uh, well, the fact is that so far our continent uh, is um, has not done much. Tunisia is at 3.6 percent of renewables, where in the rest of the world we're above 7 percent. So this will be our second priority. Our third priority will be to boost digital connectivity across the African continent. Yesterday we talked uh, about ab about the AFC FTA. Um, the African uh, continental free trade area. We need greater connectivity across Africa. And this will boost uh, uh, Africa's uh, e economy. And our fourth and last priority is South-South cooperation, what I call triangular cooperation and greater international cooperation. We must find new solutions to allow the African continent to uh, shift out of this uh, crisis. And I think we need to learn simply how to think out of the box. These are my four priorities for Africa going forward to make Africa a more sustainable and more innovative continent. 
spoken about some of the things that make Africa so unique and make us so powerful as well, whether it's the workforce, whether it's the innovation, um, digital, and these many startups that she's saying are on the continent. What is What about the African continent makes it ripe for this African century to be realized? Uh, thank you very much, Nzinga. I, I have to rely on my notes. I can't rely on my brain anymore, so I've made some <laughs> notes. And I've got a few points to make. The first one is that Obviously, everybody knows it's a very young and a very large population and going to continue to grow and going to have amongst the big, large cities of the world uh, in Nigeria, in Tanzania, and in other parts of Africa. A fast-growing middle class, 65% of the population is under the age of 35. That makes for a very, very interesting market. The analogy I use often is if you think about India of 15 years ago, I remember in 2002 we went to look at investing in broadcasting in India. And there was a narrative within our own company, people who had not been exposed culturally to, you know, to that part of the world, saw it as, uh, as infrastructure is poor, dirty, corrupt, all those kind of really bad uh, connotations, right? But if you look at India today, with that large population, and they were quite poor, right? They've taken 400 million people uh, into the middle class, right? It's a market where it's almost difficult to get in because the price of assets are so high, all of those kind of things. So I think mm -hmm. in many ways, for me, Africa represents the Indian opportunity of 10, 15 years ago. Uh, the people are resilient, super resilient. Uh, they are hungry for growth, and everybody wants a better life. And I think, to your point, uh, it's the spirit of the people one cannot ever underestimate. Uh, people are tech savvy. If you go anywhere in Nigeria, people are so, so tech savvy, it's unbelievable. There are pockets in <coughs> South Africa, in the, in the Western Cape, in other parts uh, of South Africa where, I mean, Kenya is just like supremely tech savvy. So young people are adopting and breaking the digital divide, not because the platform is there, but they themselves want to, want to break that. Mm. Uh, policy makers, and I saw a lot of debate this morning government and, and business arguing with each other about who comes first and who doesn't. We tend to take a generally positive view. When I talk to policymakers and I listen to people, I think there's a general awareness that they need to lay the foundations for growth. So I'm quite positive that policymakers are, are going to take us in the right direction, as you've already mentioned. The digital divide is narrowing and narrowing really fast. We have natural resources like sun and wind that will solve in the long run the renewal, renewable energy problem. And I think ultimately, if you look at the way we've handled the pandemic, everything looks really positive <laughs> mm, mm. Uh, for Africa in our view. And let me bring you into the conversation as someone from outside our continent. For the last 12 years, Switzerland has been ranked as the most innovative country in the world. How can Switzerland best partner with Africa in order to foster more of the innovation that has already been spoken about and that is already there as well? So th thank you very much, uh, Njinga. Uh, thank you very much for having uh, us, for having me in this, in this panel. And it's a great honor to be here and to have this occasion to, to speak about innovation in Switzerland and what we can do together with, uh, with uh, Africa. And first of all, maybe when uh, we speak, when talking about innovation, uh, what uh, do we mean with, with that? Uh, I mean new processes, I mean new products, uh, new services uh, that gives you an advantage uh, over your competitor. That's the, maybe it could be a, a definition. And uh, I will start right now, if I may, with the conclusion. And the conclusion is, for Switzerland, it is really important to work with African countries uh, and to partner with African countries to support the creation of innovative ecosystems. What does mean an innovative ecosystem? And we, uh, how can we, uh, can we, uh, could we reach that? It is through exchange of know-how. It is through uh, technology transfer. Uh, it is through investment in education, uh, in academic exchanges between our countries and uh, in the support uh, uh, for startups and small and small businesses. And that's the conclusion. And how? Do we come to this conclusion? And 
to explain that, I uh, must explain also something about Switzerland and innovative processes and innovation, history of innovation in, in, in Switzerland. And we have a very long history of innovation. You know the watchmaking, you know the pharmaceuticals, you know the machine industry, you know the textiles, you know the chemistry, you know the, the banking sector, you know the blockchain, uh, you know also the chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, chocolate making, it, it is, not, it yeah. is not, uh, not so easy. It was really, really innovative. Mm. It was really innovative uh, with the first factories in the 19th century, century with uh, the first the invention of the mix of, uh, of chocolate and milk. It sounds, it sounds obvious today. It was, it was not obvious at the beginning. And with other, other uh, uh, well, very strong innovations. And, you know, today, chocolate, it's not just only chocolate. Chocolate is also a science. It is a science, and there is a chocolate working group led by a professor uh, of the Swiss Federal Institute on, of Technology in Zurich. And saying that, I just want to tell you that innovation has this long history. And the main point now is where does it uh, come, uh, come from? And how could we have the ecosystem to do that? These ecosystems are more or less always the same have always more or less the same construction. It is a mix of educational system, educational system, high-class universities, voca vocational training in Switzerland, very well known. Uh, it is a very close, pragmatic collaboration uh, between research institutions and uh, industrial uh, partners and government at all levels. Uh, it is to use and to have startups to test new ideas. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work, it's okay. It is to have the presence also of multinationals, big firms. Uh, they push research and development, they invest in research and, and development. It, it, it is also to have the protection of intellectual property, to have uh, proper investments, and also to have the di di digitalization mm -hmm. to foster solutions. And between Africa and uh, Switzerland right now, we have partnership uh, with South Africa in the development of blockchain, for example. And we are trying to develop those, uh, those ecosystems with this example. We have also another uh, example in the health issues, where we are quite strong also with our pharmaceutical industries in, uh, in, in Switzerland. But I can explain that mm. okay. maybe later if you want. OK, Winnie, let's bring you into the conversation. We've been speaking about potential innovation here. But if we bring <coughs> the context into where we are now, emerging hopefully from a pandemic. You've spoken quite a lot about the need for Africa to be self-reliant, particularly when it comes to tech and health. So how do we make sure that that happens? Thank you. And I'm sorry I'm a bit late okay. coming out of another session. Yeah, I'm a proud African and there are many challenges, but I always see the potential of our beautiful continent. There is a bright future. By 2035, there will have been more young, smart Africans entering the workforce than in the, all the other continents combined. That's how dynamic the continent is. But right now, we have to agree that <clears throat> Africa is facing a raw deal and is being crushed. And I'm going to talk about the health sector, which I work in. We saw with the COVID pandemic how rich countries hoarded the COVID vaccines. They bought more than they could use. They left none for the rest of the world. Not only that, they also refused rich companies and their governments to share the technology so that others could produce for themselves and survive. So <clears throat> here they were making billions in profits. And here, Africa and other parts of the South were dying. This is not about being left behind. This is about being crushed. I call it being crushed, not being left behind. Because people are being left to die. Then the resource given, you are not capable. You don't have the capacity to produce it anyway. South Africa put them to shame. A, a, a company in South Africa, within one year, also made the same vaccine, just like Moderna. But Moderna would still not share is technology so that they move it to production, to, to commercial production. So some of the challenges the continent faces come from the structural barriers within mm -hmm. the global system, the trade rules that allow 
people to hold a life-saving medicine and not share the technology so that others make for themselves. Today, in the HIV world where I work, there is a new long-acting medicine to prevent HIV infection. It is available in New York, but it's not available in Nairobi. Why? Because the company which has it, Viv, will not allow others to produce it. So we are pushing and pushing and saying, you have the treatment, you have the, the, the preventive, share it with more countries. To their credit, they have shared it with a few more countries, but not all countries, particularly not those who have the capacity, like South Africa, like Brazil, to produce generics that will go cheap, that will reach everyone. So Africa must become self-reliant. But to do that, it must also work on its own issues, like build the market where products can be sold and then that are at a competitive price with other regions. That is a business, our business of integrating our market. It's happening, but needs to happen faster. But also, global rules must change so that we can have the space to innovate and to build our own medicines and, and, uh, pr and vaccines. South Africa has a hub, I must end on that one, has a, a hub for mRNA technology, that technology that was used to save lives in COVID. This hub has spokes all over the South, in Asia, in Latin America, in the Middle East, sharing technology. It's really the first model of developing technology that is shared across regions. It needs support, political support, technical support, financial support, so that it succeeds before the next pandemic. These are the things that will save us. And I'm, pos I'm optimistic because Africa is doing what's right to build its market to share. And then also, I ne we need a global movement to change global rules, make them work for yeah. all of us. Professor Budin, what Ms. Bonima is speaking about is something that you as Tunisia have been working on when it comes to cooperation among the continent, also bringing people outside, perhaps like partners from Japan. Just tell me a little bit about that. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, as for continental and international cooperation, uh, we firmly believe that uh, Africa's future lies uh, with itself and its people, you know. And uh, homegrown solution, uh, solidarity and ownership are the key principles that guide actions and policies when it comes uh, to achieve Agenda 2063 mm. priorities. And uh, in this spirit, Tunisia is sparing no effort uh, to further consolidate the intra-African cooperation and advocate for a more constructive and concrete South-South and uh, triangular uh, cooperation. And the African free trade area will definitely contribute in, acceler in accelerating Africa's de de development. <coughs> and um, as you know, uh, we have organized in late August of 2022 uh, the 8th uh, TCAT, the <coughs> Tokyo Conference for uh, Africa Development. And there we have identified a huge number of uh, mature uh, projects that uh, are uh, um, just uh, uh, that are confirmed to be uh, uh, to be um, implemented, and uh, I would like uh, to to talk also about uh, international cooperation, cooperation, because uh, international cooperation and multilateralism <coughs> uh, remains instrumental in supporting Africa's transformation agenda, and thus in helping build the continent's future. Um, there is a strong case to call for renewable, a renewable partnership with Africa uh, that embodies more the values of, uh, and this is where uh, we think uh, strongly, solidarity, sustainability, and uh, justice. Mm -hmm. And uh, as uh, demonstrated uh, uh, by the COVID-19 crisis, no one is safe unless uh, everyone is, and uh, this mantra uh, is still relevant uh, in the face of the pressing global crisis that we are facing in Africa. 
And Chaz, we've spoken quite a lot about the wonderful things about our continent and some of the challenges as well. It's not obviously, Africa is not one place that has the same environment. There are also quite a lot of challenges when you're coming in, particularly if you're an investor, if you're looking to do business. Just tell me a little bit about your experience with that. Yeah, very happy to share. We've been on the continent for 35 years. Uh, it's definitely not easy to navigate. I don't think any prize worth having is easy mm -hmm. to get to. Uh, you're right, it will be a mistake to treat the continent as one country. Mm -hmm. Your world is very different from our world. We operate in sub-Saharan Africa. It's very, very different nuances, different languages, uh, different cultural nuances, all of those kind of things. I think you need to understand those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Our philosophy as a company has been to take a macro approach uh, a macro strategic approach with a local tactical operational approach in each country. Uh, I think it requires deep belief. It's not an easy continent, so you need belief. And I think belief is really important. Mm. I think you need commitment. If you're committed, and you need to be committed for the long run, uh, that's very important. You need a deep understanding of the local nuances in each country. They are really, really important. You need to have resolve. Resolve is really important. Uh, I think giving back uh, gives you credibility. Not only giving back for giving back's sake, but I think it also brings credibility. It's natural that you have to give back. But in your local communities, in the countries in which you operate, giving back is really important. Uh, we've often taken the approach of local partnerships. In other words, we have shareholders in the major countries in which we operate. We have local management. It's very hard, I think, for a South African colonial, sometimes the rest of Africa sees South Africans as colonial in their approach. <laughs> and we've seen many South African companies go up north and fail miserably. Mm. I think part of the reason <clears throat> is that you go with a mindset of you know better mm. or you know how to operate in a country where you really don't know how to operate. So I think local partnerships are really important. And local management is really important. It's a, it's a broad philosophy of, our, of ours. And then we, we spend almost a billion dollars a year on investing in local production, local content. Mm -hmm. We are Africa's <coughs> biggest storyteller. It's something we're really proud of. So we give people what they want to see. We give them their backyards. We give them their homes. We give them their cultures back on the TV screen. Mm -hmm. We are the biggest fund of sport on the continent, if a little bit of a punt. Mm -hmm. But just a very interesting little story about getting things done I come, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the game of cricket. You wouldn't know cricket, uh, <laughs> Professor, but we'll introduce you to cricket someday. But it's a very popular sport in, in India. There's a, okay, so we started a competition, a cricket competition in South Africa. It's on at the moment, right? We partnered the federation. We became an investor. Mm -hmm. Two nights ago, in a very big stadium, 30,000 people in Johannesburg, full stadium, young people, we, we, we ask people to bid for ownership of six teams. Mm -hmm. Those six teams are all owned by Indian conglomerates. <laughs> Not one South African company, Indian conglomerates. It tells you a lot about the, if we get the platform right, if we do the right things, people will come. Mm -hmm. That's a massive investment of billions of rands in the country. Mm -hmm. Those pictures two nights ago <clears throat> of a full stadium, Indian teams supported by South Africans, went to 100 million people in India, right? And uh, sorry, there's a billion people in India, a couple of hundred people, million people would have watched it. We should not underestimate the power of those kind of things. Mm. So I'm hoping we can share some practical experiences. We're still learning, by the way. We're still learning. After 35 years, we're still learning. So we will continue to learn. Okay. And we've been through ups and downs, and I think it will be tough, and I think it will get easier, and then it will be tough again. But ultimately, we are committed to the continent. All right. President Bessé, you were speaking earlier on about collaboration, as MTS is talking about now. The world is so open and there's mm -hmm. so much opportunity and room. Just continue giving us more examples. And I, I think I, I found uh, this uh, example about the uh, mRNA uh, hub in South Africa really interesting. Because with a hub, you can start with collaboration. You can develop an environment where it is possible to, uh, to grow. Mm -hmm. But you need a, a strong anchor. And these anchors are the people. Well, you need investors, that's clear, but it's not enough. An investor can come and he can, he can go. Mm. You need an investor and he must stay. Mm. And when he go, you need other investors. How, to, how do you create that? We can create that with a strong environment. I named that before uh, ecosystem. Mm. 
And part of this ecosystem are the people, the people living here. That's why uh, education is so important. <coughs> education, um, legal, legal framework, stable legal framework, mm -hmm. stability, and the possibility to invest and to know that you have the possibilities to remain here and to have good condition to, to work. And that's why we are working uh, with, from, from Switzerland's uh, point of view with uh, African countries to develop that. What we, are, we are also really interested to, uh, to be present uh, in African countries because there is a huge potential also for us. It's, that's why it's so, so interesting. And I think uh, I mentioned before two examples. Uh, one example is blockchain. We are working with uh, South Africa on the blockchain technology. What does it mean concrete? You must be very concrete when you want to, uh, to achieve something concrete. That means we are participating or uh, Swiss participants are participating to uh, hackathons on the blockchain mm. in uh, South Africa. And we are also trying to develop contacts between our uh, education center, education universities, uh, to have exchange of people learning together, working together to have this, uh, well, this, this development to, together. Another point is the uh, health. Uh, on the health issues, we are also that strong collaborating with uh, uh, African countries. It's more for the for the product regulation, you know. You need a very good product regulation <coughs> in the health system. And it is also possible to be very innovative, to be very active in this, in this field. And we have the chance in Switzerland to have very good uh, regulation authority. And it was our goal to be open to collaboration with other countries to also create those ecosystems uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in other countries. That's maybe the two examples okay. I, can, I can bring you. All right, we, I would like to open up the floor to questions, but we need very quickly, if we can, one of the things that's going to hold us back from fulfilling the potential that's been spoken about here is the debt crisis that we're facing. How does it hold us back and what solutions are there? Yeah, debt is choking Africa and also quite a number of middle-income countries. And it's urgent that it is resolved through a multilateral legal framework open for all countries to access and to, to renegotiate their loans so that they have the fiscal space to do the things that must be done today. If you take a country like Uganda, where I'm coming from, I've just come back from my holiday, I checked in at a school to see how it's going. This is a country where kids lost two years of learning because of COVID. I found that all the government can afford to pay every year per child, if you take away the salary of teachers, is $3 in a whole year per child in school. But these are countries that are today paying two times more in debt repayments than their total budgets for education. Four times more in debt repayments than their total budgets for health. It's critical, and you're not mentioning what they need to do to manage climate impacts. These are countries flooded or in droughts cyclically. You're not talking about the security needs of these countries. Some of these countries are falling apart under the pressure from all kinds of groups. So debt is choking many countries, and it's urgent that it is resolved through a system that is better than the current common framework. Right. I'd like to open up the floor to questions. <clears throat> Thank you so much to our panellists for the insight and contributions. I'm looking forward to hear more. Let's take some audience questions. If I can ask that we start with Abdel Malek Alu, and then can I please ask, when you're asking your question, you raise your hand and Mike will come to you and you stand up so we can all see you in the room. There's a mic behind you. Thank you. Hello. Good morning. Uh, my question would be to Madam Pr Prime Minister. You talked about South-South partnerships. What about uh, regional integration? Because you are in the region that is the least integrated maybe in the world. Uh, Inter-Maghreb uh, exchange uh, accounts only for 2%. What are you doing practically so that you can have regional integration in this region? Yes. Better integration. We have already started working on integration through uh, students. We have a lot of students from sub-Saharan Africa, but also from North Africa. Why are you saying that there's only 2%? What, what, in trade? 
of the five Maghreb countries? Again, this uh, trade integration needs to be based on a number of criteria, uh, the trade balances and so on. And to the best of my knowledge, I think we are far beyond 2%, which is why I'm asking you uh, what, uh, where, where you, you obtain that figure. These are official figures. It's one of the least economically integrated areas in the world. Well, that figure that you're putting forward is uh, is perhaps uh, perhaps does not reflect full reality fully. But what we have tried to do is to boost uh, the connection and uh, common infrastructure, notably with uh, Algeria, with the Trans-Saharan, uh, with the corridor, with a number of infrastructures, major infrastructures that are going to be built, the uh, deep water uh, port. We've just finished uh, building the motorway from... Uh, uh, Tunis through Gambes and Mednin. But I think probably uh, the most important issue is uh, building connections uh, by land or air. Red tie there would like to ask a question and two more people here. Uh, Maybe just to follow up on this question, I'm Binta Diop and... Uh, the Special Envoy of the African Union. And if I may to say that uh, if you look at the uh, free trade area, which is mean that some of the countries of the Maghreb are also part of the continent, even if it's mm -hmm. at the north, I think there are opportunity to see that integration as a continent, as you have, uh, Madam Prime Minister said, Agenda 2063 and others, are there to make sure that we open our corridor and uh, we have that regional opportunities. Maybe your question is how do we uh, make sure also that in terms of the political integration uh, as well, because we do cut the, the, the economic, but also how the, the region, because we have ECOWAS, we have the SADC, we have the, uh, all the <coughs> region which are integrated. So maybe they will have some kind of challenges when it comes from region to region. But I think CFTA is really a good uh, uh, opportunity to use for the regional integration of our, uh, of our <coughs> continent. And I see uh, Winnie, thank you for bringing the light in terms of the health, uh, uh, security, but also on other issues of, uh, of Africa. Uh, I think this is a time for us to restart you know, and to build back better. There Thank are you. opportunities here and with the community, the business community. Uh, and what uh, mm -hmm. uh, has been said, the example of uh, Prime Minister have said, uh, 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 the president of uh, <coughs> Switzerland have talked about chocolate. How do we use that uh, solution and learn from uh, uh, what Switzerland have done to replicate it uh, in other countries mm -hmm. that are for example, producing, uh, uh, you know, the, the, uh, those uh, resources. So I think that's where the connectivity <coughs> should be there with uh, some countries. Uh, so opportunities are there. Mm -hmm. I think we need to seize it. The Thank gentleman you. at the back with the red tie had a question. Can we just get the mic to him, please? Can I please implore that as we've got 10 minutes left, mm. we... Uh, have quite succinct questions and, and responses as well. I don't know if you'd like to, anyone would like to respond before we, we listen to the gentleman of the red tie. <clears throat> well, just to add on the integration mm -hmm. question, that uh, we, we need to be clear. Economic integration has to be about the advantage you have as a block to trade and to, through trade to make improvements in people's lives. North Africa is part of Africa. And I think Morocco is the country <coughs> that really has learned that lesson, perhaps in a bit of a hard way. M Morocco tried very hard to be part of European Union. The Europeans said, you are not European enough. 
they refused. Morocco then came back and is now part of the African Union. We embrace them very well. But they are now reaping the opportunities. Country after country now, I'm seeing very, very many Moroccan companies going for contracts mm. in infrastructure, mm. in whatever. Mm. So integration is about the opportunity mm -hmm. to trade and mm. use trade to improve lives. Mm. Thank you very much. Please go ahead. Bonjour, uh, je m'appelle James Keaton. Je suis... Uh, hello, I'm James Keaton from AP, based in Geneva. I had a question from Madam Prime Minister, uh, notably about the uh, development. We are talking about debt and a reduction of debt for African nations. We saw that the IMF uh, has recently suspended funding for Tunisia uh, loans, uh, notably, uh, to pay for uh, civil servants. And uh, my question to you is, uh, we have witnessed a, uh, we saw the, the result of the general election in Tunisia with very low, a very low turnout last month. So, I mean, how worried, how concerned are you with the future of democracy in Tunisia and the uh, economic fallout of that? A few seconds for question. Uh, please respond. Yes. Alors, si, si je prends... I'm, I didn't really understand. Could you be more precise? You said that the IMF had suspended the debt. No, the IMF has suspended a number of loans uh, granted by the IMF to pay the wages of uh, civil servants, public workers, public sector workers. No, no, that is absolutely wrong. I can't comment on that. So. Madam, my question is very simple. How concerned are you that uh, issues with democracy in a, in a nation that was one of the pillars of the Arab Spring may have economic, what well, the economic fallout of that may be for your country? Could you repeat that? Let me tell you. If your question gets answered, I'm just left with seven minutes. So I want to make sure as many interactions as possible happen. Please stand up, introduce yourself. Question in 30 seconds or less, who's it directed to? Uh, Joe Kenner, presidency of Greyston in New York. I wanted you to talk about, because we haven't heard much about the impact and the challenges you see with the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. So if folks could give us the challenges and opportunities you see with that. Thank you very much. Anyone would like to volunteer? I, I, say I that would yes? say I would say something on, the, on this issue. Thank you very much for that. Uh, as a Swiss president, it's quite difficult for me to speak about it, but uh, I try to, to give to give a, well what, what uh, I can uh, talk about it. Our, yesterday, to this breakfast we had with the African countries, and it was uh, the main theme, the, the main issue, the free trade agreement. And I must tell you, I was really impressed to see one free trade agreement with 1.7 billion people. It's huge, it's fantastic, and uh, it must be very well implemented. It, mean, it means a lot. But what means implementation? You need for that to have the really implementation on the field. You need to have a good logistics. You need to have good travel possibilities to have people in contact. It was also amazing, not so positive, amazing yesterday to see that uh, to travel from one African city to one another African city, you have to go to, to come to Brussels or to, to Paris, to, to improve this situation, to have better contacts and to develop stability, legal, legal framework, stability, institutions, and uh, it will be a very, very strong, strong thing. I just wanted to underline this because I think it is, for, it is absolutely key for the, for the, next, for the next decade. So right. Can I just add, it's easier for us to travel into the rest of Africa, from mm -hmm. South Africa, where people based in Dubai, because it's easier to use Emirates to get into mm. Ghana, Nigeria, Tanzania, anywhere else, as opposed to traveling from South Africa, mm. which is a real problem. Mm. Mm. Your question in 30 seconds or less, and who's addressed you, please? Thank you. Hi, I'm Sangu Deli of YGL from Ghana. So my question is, we, we've spoken about the travel connectivity issues and economic integration and the hope of, of the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. But before we get to that, there's the most basic thing which is the, the movement of people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As it stands today, if I have a US passport or a European passport, it's easier to travel across Africa than if I go with my Ghanaian passport. How do we fix this? Thank you. Thank you. Mm. 
<clears throat> Rini? Yeah. It's, it's easy to say what should happen. It's tougher to do it. But definitely African countries, African leaders, are seeing the importance of free movement of people and goods. Uh, the challenge there is that some countries are doing better than others economically. There's a tendency for people to look for greener pastures. And then that also results into a migration problem for some countries. These are real challenges. But I'm seeing many countries moving away from that. Take, for example, for us in East Africa. Now we've brought back the East African passport. With my East African passport, I can move six countries in our region. So there's progress that's happening, but it's a bit slow. We need to move it faster. Right, I'm checking if there's any more questions from the floor as we have three minutes or so remaining. One last very quick question before we get the gentleman's questions answered in the red. All right, we can go back to that question. I don't know if you've thought about it and you're able to answer or you want to have that discussion later. Yes. Yeah? Yeah, of course. If you understood, Donc, vous pouvez répéter <coughs> votre question. So could you repeat your question? Well, I'm sorry if I was a little, perhaps a little bit, uh, if I asked it, asked it uh, in a complicated manner. But please, do go ahead and uh, ask it again. So let's set aside the IMF issue for the time being. It, it's just a very basic question. Uh, there was a general election in Tunisia with a very, very low turnout. In the first round, yes. Tunisia was a symbol of the Arab Spring. It still is, sir. We are just uh, undergoing a democratic transition. We are moving from one model to another. I'm sure that you will understand that resistance to change is a very powerful phenomenon. Uh, this uh, general election is not over yet. There will be a second round on January 29th, and I'm sure that you will see that we'll, we'll have a much better turnout. Does that answer your question? Because there's a sense that there was another aspect, an economic aspect, that you thought w was uh, connected to the democratic transition. Yes, I was saying, do you think that problems with democracy, which uh, uh, people who turn towards Tunisia uh, with very hopeful eyes and what they've accomplished, is that in any way endangered by that very low turnout? And may, may there be fallout from that economically for your country? Why don't we talk about this after January 29th? Of course, I'm delighted that you are deeply interested uh, in the future of Tunisia, and uh, you are expressing uh, something and asking questions which, of course, many people are thinking long and hard about. But let me assure you that Tunisia's democratic transition is absolutely not under threat, that we are currently accomplishing a full democratic transition. We are, there's a true change of paradigm. We are transitioning from one regime to another. And I'm sure that you will see uh, I am very hopeful, I have full confidence in our people, and as I do for the whole of the African continent, I'm very hopeful that Tunisia, uh, Tunisia's situation will improve and that we're probably going to accomplish things that will surprise you. Nobody's talking to Nisha. We're going to wrap up to... and try and continue the discussion. What I am going to ask the World Economic Forum to do, though, is make sure that we have the next Africa session we have is an hour and a half. Yeah. Because last year when I moderated <clears> this discussion as well, it also got very heated. We've got so many different countries. We've got so many different opinions and so many different issues on the continent. And this is just an example of how we need so much more time uh, to ventilate the issues and really have discussions among different role players in the country, in the countries and in the world. I'd like to thank you all so much for yeah, this. We combine the yeah. African passion discussion. with Swiss precision. Uh, <laughs> we will be good to go. We will realize okay. the African century. Thanks so much for your time and attention. Good afternoon.